Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dean Seddon podcast. I'm Dean Seddon and I've got a special guest with me again today. I've got David Wood and I'm not going to tell you what he does because he's got a very interesting story to tell. David, welcome. Good morning, Dean. So, David, you know the rules about this podcast, right? Uh, no, but right. you're going to tell me. <laughs> so the only piece of paper we've got is we've both got a piece of paper which has got some bullet points on. Yeah. I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to stick to the bullet points. Okay. Um, but David, tell us tell us a bit about what you do right now and then we'll dig into your backstory. Okay. So uh, right now I've got several businesses, but the main business that I'm growing at the moment is my coaching business, which mm -hmm. is coaching business owners, how to scale their businesses, how to get more out of their business and how to gain clarity and control over their business. So you're not going to make somebody a millionaire in 90 days, right? Uh, no, certainly uh, not. You don't drive a Lamborghini? No, never owned one. But you have exited and sold businesses. Yeah. In, um, real businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started a business with a £3,000 investment, scaled it to 22 million with 2 million EBITDA a year profit, sold it to an investment bank, and then ended up buying it back and reselling <laughs> it at 31 million revenue. So, uh, yeah. That's not bad. That's that's proper business, that. Um, it was. It was supplying airlines and cruise ships globally with food and beverage, um, so handling the distribution for big brands. Um, in high secure areas. So given you've done all of that, why didn't you just check out? Why didn't you just go, I'm done? Um, great question. So when I sold the business first time round um, in 2007, um, I retired for two weeks. <laughs> um, I had no emails, no phone calls, no networking events to go to, and I was completely bored. So I got involved in property and started a dot com business then. Wow. Okay. So you d did the whole another b another business again. Yeah. So you kind of you've kind of got the itch for business, right? Um, since a very young age, I've been very entrepreneurial. So I had three jobs when I was thirteen. I grew up in the Midlands, so uh, my parents were uh, lower middle class, let's say. And uh, if I wanted some branded trainers, I had to work and earn the money myself to do it. So I worked in a fish and chip shop. I did two paper rounds and carried at a golf course at the weekends. Wow. Wow, that's intense. Yeah. Most people just get pocket money from their parents these days. No, 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 no. I uh, I, I definitely worked, and I, I'm, I'm a workaholic. Um, I enjoy working, and I get a real kick out of seeing people grow. So. so coming to the coaching world, right, there's, like, it feels like anybody can be a coach these days. You know, you, you've, you could just quit your job and become a coach. You're going into a very competitive crowded marketplace yep. and we'll we'll argue about how you get through that and you know we're working on that but what made you want to do this uh, another great question so i left school without an education and prior to starting my own business i was a golf professional um so i knew how to hit golf balls but i didn't um uh, and was mixing with uh, entrepreneurial people on the golf course so I, I would absorb the information that I learned with the way people negotiated, saw the deals that they did. You got a real education on the green. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I had a knee injury, I had to stop playing golf. I, um, I decided to start my own business, and that business was started by accident, would you believe? So um, we were at a party, and someone was looking quite miserable. Um, so I asked if they were okay, and they said no, they were going to lose their job because the supplier kept left letting them down, substandard products, substandard service. Uh, and that's how I started the business, which I sold. So hang on. You're at a party. Somebody's looking miserable. Yeah. You go over to them. They're worried about losing their job. And instantly you kind of invent a business to s solve their problem, right? Well, kind of, yeah. It was similar to that, yeah. So um, they, they were being let down by their, by their current supplier um, and overinflated prices for substandard products and service. So um, I didn't know anything about the industry. So my entrepreneurial self said, there's an opportunity. How do I fix this? And I just said, look, if I can find a way to help you, would that help you with your job and would that help the business? And both answers were yes. So, so I went off and sourced some support. Would it be fair to say you were winging it in that moment? 100%. <laughs> 100%, yeah. So so you got this business started from a you know literally chance encounter. You yep. seized the opportunity. You winged it. Yeah. Um, 
at what point did this go, did you go, whoa, this is getting serious now, right? Yeah, so um, after about nine months of supplying this one client, um, we got offered 17 additional units across the UK for the same company. Wow. Um, so, which, which we took on. And it's pretty scary though, having one client, right? Uh, you've got to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to start somewhere and you always start with one client. Um, but because of the industry that we we're in, it was quite, it, well, it was very niche. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, it's a close network. So other airlines then found out that we were supplying this one client and Virgin Atlantic came on board within 18 months. Jeez, all from winging it at a party. All from winging it at a party, yeah. And then probably six months after that, um, again, through a chance encounter, through a golf day, I um, I ended up playing golf with the head buyer for Carnival Cruise Lines. And we were invited to tender for them. And our first tender won uh, just over a million pounds worth of business. So we went from aviation supply to VIP lounges to supplying cruise ships within sort of two years. So you've really kind of grown your businesses by unlocking relationships building relationships is absolute key yeah people buy from people it's a cliche but it's absolutely true but they have to support you have to support that with great service um reliability trustworthiness um and great systems because mm. if you don't do that then the relationship won't last won't last so just to be a bit provocative, you started winging it. Mm -hmm. At what point did you stop winging it? I didn't. Um, <laughs> so um, probably six years in, um, when we got to about six or seven million pounds worth of revenue, it, it was... Hang on, some people are going to be like, you were still winging it at six and seven million? Y yeah, absolutely. I mean... Th there was no process we had, and and we'll come on to why I do what I do now because of this sto th this part, start of the journey. Um, but yeah, every day was how do we sell more? That was the goal. That was the strategy. How do we, how do we improve the relationships? How do we improve the service? But it wasn't a sit down talk with the team. You know, um, it was this is what I'm doing because it was a very very small team at the time. Wow. Um, and then when I sold the business, um, I ended up repurchasing the business a couple of years later and it had challenges in the business that I hadn't experienced. So I ended up getting my own mentor and coach and um, that started my my passion for personal development. What kind of things, were you, when you say never experienced, mm. what kind of things are you talking about? Yeah, great question. So um, we went, so when I took the business back, um, I inherited um, a bad culture. I inherited um, a business which had gone from making profit to debt. Right. So wh when I first started the business, we were always cash positive. Mm -hmm. So I never really had to look. We looked at cash, obviously, but we, it wasn't something that we had to be concerned about yeah. because we had a million plus in the bank and lots of credit lines with all our suppliers to really being challenged by suppliers withdrawing credit limits and um, um, strained relationships with suppliers. It was like, what do we do to overcome all this and quickly? So you were in a firefight really from... Well, it, it was a turnaround. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. We needed to turn the business around. And within six months, we'd turn the business round into just about profit. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's an incredible from, achievement. From half a million um, loss. Wow. Yeah. That's massive. Yeah. So you're translating this into now you your journey, what you've done, what you've achieved, the scars, the successes. Yep. You're helping other businesses. What are some of the key things that you think come out in what you do in terms of coaching that people know and but still don't do? Yeah, so what a lot of small business owners and entrepreneurs do is they start to get into the detail of the business um, and they forget about the basics, mm -hmm. you know. So um, it might be they're trying to win a big client or they're trying to work on a new strategy, but they don't have systems in place which run the business for them. 
so they can look at one chart or one spreadsheet where um, all their critical numbers mm -hmm. are detailed. So just by looking at one number, they can tell the the health of maybe sales or the health of um, their purchasing team. Um, so uh, putting that system in place is probably one of the biggest things. Mm -hmm. But consistency. Um, and we, we were talking about a really simple thing about um, improving cash flow. Yeah. And you were listing out a whole load of really straightforward things that you go, yeah, you absolutely should do that, which is, you know, how do you manage your debtor days? Yeah. Everybody on earth goes, oh, yeah, 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 we, we proactively manage our debtor days. But you you put down some quick things you did in your business in terms of improving them. Do you want to run through some of those? so that? Yeah, sure. So uh, first and foremost is to have a, a strategy or, or a system to go through. Um, and number one is monitor your debtor days mm -hmm. daily. Because a lot of people say we'll review them once a week or we'll re review them at the end of the month. Who's paid, who hasn't. So being proactive by checking it daily mm -hmm. um, would be the first point. The second point would be to ensure invoices are raised on time. Mm -hmm. I know that I went through a stage in the business when I repurchased it that we were sending stock out, but we weren't invoicing for four or five days. Yeah. And when your customers are paying 90 days later, yeah, those that, four days. that's a huge impact, yeah. especially when you're... When you're uh, invoicing several hundred thousand pounds a week. And and if, say for an example, you've got a company where their their terms are so many days month end, you just tick over into the next month and yeah. actually it's a month wait. Yeah. A month longer. Yeah. Yeah, even one day could, could trigger that into an extra 30 days, yeah. which you're then, uh, if, if you're purchasing and selling products or manufacturing, uh, that's a huge impact mm -hmm. on the business. And it could stop you from doing something else with that cash, yeah. you know, uh, uh, and turning that cash into, in, into more profit. So what, what are some of the other things you can do in terms of engineering or pr making sure you're getting paid when you need it? Yeah, so um, setting up a system where you contact your supplier, uh, sorry, customer, two weeks in advance. So sending maybe an email or giving them a quick call to check that there's no issues with the invoice that's going to be payable in two weeks' time. Uh, and then seven days prior is just checking that the payment's been made. And there's no, no 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 systems internally within that customer holding that up because yeah, it happens a lot. There's nothing worse, particularly I, I know big companies, they've got checks and balances and, all, and you understand that. But sometimes what happens is somebody goes on holiday, they need to sign that off. It gets buried under a mountain of paperwork. Yep. You're going, oh, yeah, yeah, they pay 60 days or 90 days or someone 20 days. Uh, and you're thinking, oh, and what's happened is it's been sat on somebody's desk, buried yeah. at the bottom. The finance department or the uh, account's payable, can't do anything with it until they've signed it off. And you're, you're right, actually. If you just sit on it and expect them to sort it out, sometimes it doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah so being proactive is key. Um, but what I experienced with a product business was we would ship maybe uh, 100 lines on an invoice and it would get to 90 days and we say no payments come through what's going on oh there's a query on one of the lines mm. you know and that line might be 20 pounds but the invoice is for 40,000 mm. and they hold the whole invoice back and yeah. then they ask for a delivery note which you've already sent them so it, it some companies i'm not saying all companies do this but it's delayed tactics to help their own mm -hmm. um cash flow situation so you have to be proactive over your own cash flow situation so, so obviously cash cash is king, yep. particularly going into a recession. Yeah. So you'll be helping in your work. You're helping a business owner look at okay, what's the landscape of how do I protect my cash? Yeah. But how do you help them grow all that business or make it more profitable? Okay, so there's um, there's lots of different tools and systems we can put in place to do that, mm -hmm. but um, I would say leverage your existing customer network and supplier network through referrals. Mm -hmm. uh, find out how you can uh, sell more products to the same clients, mm -hmm. make more sales to those same clients. So if they're only buying from you once a week, is there any way that you could get them to buy from you twice a week? Um, obviously to increase, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> increase pricing um, where necessary. Mm -hmm. um, 
add value, you know, what additional value can you add to your clients that your, your competitors aren't? So, um, you know, what services could you offer? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of my customers once asked, could we start supplying um, uh, fresh frozen um, and chilled products in addition to all the ambient products that we did? And we looked at it and actually that added about seven million pounds to our revenue. Jeez. Yeah. So, so when... For the same client, sorry. Wow, yeah. okay. So just on, you were talking about referrals. Yeah. Right? I, I know a lot of people who have, have nailed referrals. Yeah. But a lot of people feel uncomfortable about asking a client to introduce them to somebody else. Yeah. How did you, did you encounter that awkwardness? How did you get around that? Um, Is it just a case of, actually, I've built up such a good relationship, it's not... It's not as fr- like client supplier relationship. You know them more personally. Yeah, so um, it, it is about the relationship. So uh, again, the the industry that we were in, um, it's a very tight industry. Everyone knows everyone. Although there's millions of flights going every year and uh, millions of passengers, you know, the actual number of airlines was about 120 globally at the time. Major airlines. So everyone would know everyone within that sector and they'd see what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they'd see that you're offering a better service or a better product line and they'd see your vehicles everywhere. And then they go to your customers and ask for your details and they're not in competition in that way because they've got different routes to fly to and so on and so forth. So, you know, the referrals just came. And what was more surprising was how easy it was to get referrals from suppliers suppliers yeah so you know suppliers so for instance accountants uh, our accountant would have customers who would have a want or need for our service or products and they would recommend our business um to to their customers so yeah i think when you're looking at referrals don't just look at your customers look at your supply base as well because it's all if they're not in comp- competition with you you know, and you've got a good relationship, they will refer you. But it's all down to the relationships you build. Relationship, 100%. So um, you've gone into this coaching world. Yeah. Yeah. With the good, the bad, and the ugly in coaching. Yeah. What's, what's your mission? What's the, what are you really... Because you're not doing it for the money. Yeah. Right? What's your mission? So um, going back to my story... When I bought the business back and I had to take on these challenges, which I which I didn't uh, know how to deal with, um, I took on my own coach and mentor, um, which reignited or ignited because I wasn't really great at school as an academic, but my my passion for learning. If it's factual and it's about business, I'm I'm a hundred percent. I'm all in. Um, so I just get absorbed and almost obsessive over these things. So reading these books, listening to these audio books, being coached by some of the best coaches in the world. And the pleasure that it gave me learning from those people and then seeing my team improve as I was coaching them made me realize that industry, business and industry is great. Making money is great. But the the satisfaction factor that you get from helping someone else seeing them grow the aha moment when the penny drops when they go do you know what i just didn't see that and sometimes it's so easy and so basic yeah sometimes that you don't see what's obvious or you know it but you can't see it or you don't do it yeah yeah so so a lot of businesses you know everybody's obsessed with oh i've built my business for exit but not everybody has built their business or wants to build their business for it for an exit yep. um what do you do to help those people um a lot of small business owners entrepreneurs start a business from the skill sets that they've got so i i normally use the analogy of a baker mm-hmm. um so a baker is making bread and cakes for a bakery they're really good at what they do they're not really getting the most out of their employment where they are or there's some there's a disjoint mm-hmm. between them and the business owner so they think i'm great at what i do i'll go and do it myself so they set up a business um and they make brilliant products mm-hmm. so they're doing the technical work what 
they lose sight of is as the business grows, they take on more employees, they need a bigger premises. And so the business grows, but so does the complexity. So rather than doing the technical work, they end up running the business, which is a completely different skill set to what they've had. So they learn on the, on, on the fly, which is what I did, but the tools that I've learned from other people who've been through that process, if I'd have known that the first time I had my business. Eliminate a lot of pain. It, well, it would have probably been three times bigger and the profitability would be much higher as well. Do you think though, some of those expert technicians, because it's a labor of love, do you think they settle for a tough business because they love what they do? I think they probably don't know any different. I think they get into the business and they just go, this is how it sh probably should be or is going to be. And they don't see that there's another option where they can say, right, okay, the technical business is doing really well because we're growing sales, we're mm -hmm. making money, all those good things. But the stress and the frustration which they get from running the business side of the business, you know, we talked earlier about debtor days. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they're supplying a local business with sandwiches on a daily basis and invoice once a month or something like that. All of a sudden they find themselves in a cash flow problem. They don't know what to do, mm -hmm. you know, so and, and then they scratch their heads and they try their best to get through it. Um, you know, why wouldn't you want to get some help and, and eliminate those challenges? Yeah. And um, I was just thinking about um, recently I was talking to a person and and they were like so in love with their products because you know they created it it was their almost a part an extension of them yeah that that they love this bit but actually they hated the business they'd got yeah but they couldn't get out of it yeah and they just actually at one point they said i wish i could go back to working in a job where i just did this and I think sometimes what happens is if you don't nail that business side, yeah. you kind of end up where you just become an employee for your own business, doing yeah. a job that you don't even like. Well, you own a job. Yeah. You don't own a business. You own a job. Um, and like you say, it's a, a job you don't like, really. Yeah. yeah. So so you're not going to make people millionaires overnight. No. Because that's you know not what you do. Yeah. And you're in serious business. What are some of the things you're hoping to achieve with your business over the next 12 months? Um, so over the next 12 months, my plan is, is to help at least 20 entrepreneurs um, regain control of their business or gain clarity of what they need to do. And over a 12 month period, help them implement tools and systems which will transform their business into a um, we used to have an analogy of a sausage machine. You'd put in the ingredients in one end and out comes a perfect product and it just runs seamlessly. That's what we do is we implement systems and tools which help control, give clarity and execute those plans. Now, that sausage factory analysis analogy, it's very apt because there's machines and cogs and all that kind of stuff, but it's not the most sexy thing that people, like people go, I want to make more money. Yeah. I want to make sales. I want to, you know, and they've got all of this wish list of stuff. Yeah. But I find this on the marketing and sales front. I'm sure you'll find it. Often what happens is people underappreciate the power of a system mm. in the pursuit of a goal. Yeah. So um, wh when I uh, re-inherited the business, um, our cash flow was tight. And um, we took it from negative cash flow to positive of 350,000 in a three month period. And we did that through implementing a system, you know, and the power of one, looking mm -hmm. at things and improving them by 1% every day mm -hmm. really is key and critical to how you do that. And but it is cheesy, but when you were talking earlier about, you know, having almost like a dashboard of key metrics, yeah. um, even if you see it and something starts to deteriorate, it's in your head straight away. Yeah. And whilst that might not be, you might not come up with a grand remedial plan because debtor days of little actions, it prompts little actions. Yeah. Seeing that number every day or that number dive a little bit or go up a little bit, it, it, it kind of just gives you that nudge every day to go, 
oh, we need to nudge this or we need to do this. So yeah, it, exactly. If you think of it as a Formula One team, you know, they're constantly testing and measuring and they won't get it right all the time. So you'll see a dip off on something or you might make a change in one area. So let's improve cash flow by trying to reduce our debtor days. But then your customer service starts to slip because you haven't got stock in time. Mm -hmm. um, so it is about playing with those critical numbers um, on a daily basis. And I would call that the lifeline or the pulse or the oxygen of the business, those mm -hmm. critical numbers daily being monitored. Wow. So um, what are some of the things uh, going into a recession? Obviously, everybody want to save money. Cash is king, as we know. Um, what are some of the things that, because I'm sure you've been through a few recessions re leading businesses. Yeah. What are some of the painful things that people need to don't get doom and gloom but yeah. really need to be mindful of right now yeah so um the first one is debtor days mm -hmm. really because as you know your business might be doing okay but other people that you're supplying might not be mm -hmm. so therefore if you start to see your debtor days being elongated you need to start talking to those clients now um and understanding what their pain is and how you can help them achieve what they need to do t to survive through it. So watch your debtor days would be my first key point, yeah. Mm. And then monitoring margins as costs are rising. You know, um, some small businesses are reluctant to raise prices because I might lose the customer. Well, what's worse, losing the customer or actually going bankrupt because yeah, you're, you're not, not raising your prices? Yeah. yeah, you're not making any money. So so watching your margins on a daily basis and, and looking at your sales on a daily mm. basis. And actually, it's it's really interesting. Um, last night, we talked a little bit. It was quite a late night last night. But, it was. Um, <laughs> last night, we talked about how little tweaks in different places can be success or failure. So debtor days slipping by a couple of days, um, price increases over here, payroll increases here. Um, you know, little things in little places can create big holes or yep. little things in big places can create big opportunities. Yeah. It's often little nudges in lots of places rather than this one big thing that's going to change everything. Yeah, I, I think you've got to, I, I think making small changes on a daily basis and monitor the impact and then reviewing that daily with the team is key. It's pointless making a big change and then the thing falls over. So it is minute changes to systems. Mm. Yeah. So And uh, focus, of course. If you're looking at numbers, your focus is there 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, uh, you know, when I learned to drive, I um, don't really told you this, but when you learned to drive, but when I learned to drive, um, I was constantly driving and worried about hitting the curb. Right. So I was really focused on actually the curb not where I was positioned in the road and um, ended up hitting the curb. Yeah. And it was like, why when I'm trying to avoid the curb, do I end up hitting the curb? And my driving instructor said to me, and it's never, I've never forgotten this, uh, what you focus on is what you get. Exactly, 100%. And that's true in everything in life, isn't it? Yeah. That if yeah, you, you, you are where, where your actions have taken you. Where you are today is what your actions have delivered and where you've been looking. And if you want a different result, you've got to do different things. So um, recession coming, not coming. Uh, God. I think it's coming. Yeah. I think we're here, to be honest with you, as we speak. Yeah. No, uh, I know in the US there's some debate about whether there's a recession or not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that's more about politics than anything else. But um, what was fascinating to me is the last proper recession we had was 2008, 2009. Yeah. Obviously, COVID created a recession, but actually the, the government support kind of absorbed all of that kind of impact of a recession. Well, it was a sticky plaster over it yeah. for the time, yeah. So what was fascinating to me, when you look at it, if you strip out the COVID period, um, 2022-23 recession, say, the last one was, was it 8-9? Yeah. Yeah. 7-8-9, yeah. 7-8-9. Um, so there's, there's people now who are 
in the working world, living their life, who've never known an economic downturn or a recession. Yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I've i experienced 2008-9. I was too young, for thankfully, for some of the others. Maybe yeah. to, maybe the dot-com one. Yeah. Um, what's some of the things that happen in a recession? I know I'm te- probably some of people will be like, oh, what are you talking about recession for? You're, yeah. One, you're making people miserable. And two, <laughs> uh, you're telling people <laughs> the obvious. But a lot of people don't realize what a recession is. Yeah. Yeah. What does that feel like? What What do you see? You know, I'm not asking you to pin your colors to mass, but what do you think is going to happen? Um, uh, I think everyone, I, I, I think the difference between this recession um, is it's the cost increases in fuel um, are going to impact more families. Mm-hmm. So... I think if you're an employee, a recession doesn't impact you as much as if you're a business owner, mm-hmm. um, because the biz- the, you're, you're claiming your salary and the companies will pay your salary. Um, when you're a business owner, if you stop trading with clients, that's hitting you in the pocket. Now you might have to make people redundant if money gets tight, but where this is going to be different is people now are choosing between are they choosing to pay their their electric or their gas or buy food or whatever? Um, and I don't think I've experienced one a recession like that, mm. or, or um, a, a period of time where that's been uh, uh, problematic. But then you've got the cost increase of food. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, it's it's a tough situation. I think we've just started to see. I think this week they've just released some numbers saying that growth has slowed or or, or reversed fractionally this this week, um, but with interest rates rising, where where do they go? Um, I don't have an answer for you. To be honest well, with you, Dean, we can go round in circles. I, all day. I I wonder whether the recession's already happened. Yeah, it's already started, and actually all of this intervention to try and ease the blow of it is all too late. Yeah, because vast majority of people I speak to, they've already curbed their expenditure because they're already worried. Yeah. So the consumer spending's already dropped. So we're only going to find, and, and now the interest rates are coming in to kind of curb expenditure that's already yeah. stopped. So yeah. what we're doing is we're piling credit card interest, loan interest, mortgage interest, car payment interest on top of inflation. Yeah. I think, I think something's going to have to give there. Yeah, I, I think... With with businesses, with COVID and the help that the government gave, I, I think th- th- there was a lot of businesses which were in trouble before COVID happened. Mm-hmm. So they took out these loans um, or support and they didn't use those for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and now the market's returned. There is no further support. Um, those companies are now going to really struggle. So I, I think... Um, we've still got an impact to come from COVID from mm-hmm. a from a small medium business point of view, um, and from that, you know, you 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 could be running a brilliant business, be on top of everything, but you've got a big client, and they don't pay their bills mm-hmm. because they've masked their problem for the last two three years. I think I with think support. I said this the other day in a live. I don't think. I, it feels like anyway, nobody's joining the dots that, let's say you were you were okay before the pandemic, but obviously the pandemic, for some businesses it didn't impact and and yep. they prospered and some it re- really hurt, so they, you know they took the support they got the support and I thought the support packages were brilliant. Yeah, um, I don't think you could have done much more than. No, done. I think what the government did was right at the time and. The only critique I would have is when the support started, everybody had the perception that this was short term, yeah, a few months, and it turned into two years. But some businesses have gone, right, this is over now. Now's time to get back on our feet, get going, and bang another thing. Yeah. And I, I worry that this kind of double whammy of this impact, now another, 
you've got businesses generally yep. businesses are generally businesses are coming out of covid with more debt than they went in yeah and they're going into a crisis an economic crisis that's going to hit back the revenue so a bit like yep. we talked about earlier those numbers you've got more debt potentially uh, a slowdown in sales and revenue higher interest rates yeah so you've got all of these things pinching away and i don't think it's a i don't think it's a good I don't know. I don't want to talk it up, yep. but at the same time, the the uh, signs look like it could be quite prickly. Not because just the recession on its own, but the overhang. Yeah, I uh, I would agree with that. Yeah, it's... um, but I do wonder. I know we're kind of going off on a tangent. You know, all these high energy bills, right? Let's just say they do get to where they are. Are we seriously in a place where? the electricity companies are going to cut people off. I, th I think if they're really serious about the prices they're putting in through, they have no choice to do that. But um, you've got to think of the ethics of the business. I know someone a couple of weeks ago had a meeting with a large oil company. Bought, um, they were an advisor and said, you really need to think about the profits that you're declaring and what's that doing to the families within the UK, trying to get to work. And this person said, when this person said this, they were completely blasé about it. And it's sort of, it's business. Yeah, the problem oh, is that if, if people start to hurt, yeah. politicians have to respond. Yeah, And at the moment, I, I get the sense um, that nobody wants to really grab hold of this they're, they're proposing stuff but nobody really wants to grab hold of this it's that accountability bit isn't it i mean if they really grab hold of it and really make something happen and it's really the wrong thing they're going to get the blame mm. and people in this day and age don't like or most people don't like to take bull, the bull by the horns and make a decision you know they need to get buy-in for it before they'll do it yeah, they want. They, yeah, we come full circle, really, actually, yeah. because everybody really, what happens is in life, if we can avoid making a decision, or wait till the evidence is there that that's the right decision, then yep. we make the decision, and that's often too late. Yeah, and whether you're a politician or a business owner, that's a real risk. Yeah, unless you are monitoring things daily, and then you know that if you change something one day and it doesn't work, you can change it back the next. It's not a big risk, is it? No. You know, you've lost a day or maybe a week. Um, but, yeah, if you're making big decisions with nothing to support it, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So somebody's starting a business right now. Yep. Yeah. What would you be your advice to somebody who's going, do you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit the day job. I, I want to run my own business. What would be your advice to people who are thinking of doing that? Yeah, um, it depends what industry they're in, really. But I, I'd say make sure that you um, understand what your your key metrics are on a daily basis. I know because, like we were talking earlier about the baker, you know, um, knowing what your cost of goods are, mm -hmm. you know, um, knowing what you need to make and how you're going to make that. So have it doesn't have to be an in-depth, all singing, all dancing business plan. Because what I find with these things is, is people spend a lot of time implementing plans and strategies. Sorry, designing and developing them, but then they don't execute them. That's. Do you know what? That's like that's like a lot of marketing strategies. They write this complicated document, which looks brilliant. Yeah, but it's impossible to implement. Yeah, because they've either they've they've designed a plan that's too complex for their setup. Yeah. Or it's big, it's a, it's not a plan that's implementable. In yeah. other words, it's just a big document with no real action. It's just yeah. if you're going for investment, it looks great. Yeah. Um, but if you're trying to run a business on a document which is 200 pages, you can't do it. I mean, um, there's a, a book by the Navy SEALs. Um, um, if I could think of the name, uh, anyway, uh, they they have. Um, decide what they're going to do and execute so it's what's the action how are we going to execute it those are the two things they think about in the battlefield yeah you know and that's a war where people's lives 
Do you think sometimes people make plans as a way to avoid taking action? It's definitely a good way to procrastinate. <laughs> Because <laughs> it feels productive, doesn't it? It feels productive to make yeah. a plan. Yeah, you, you, you write it all out. And I'm not saying don't make a plan. You have to make a plan, but then you have to make a plan which you are going to you and your team are going to execute. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. It's going to be a doc document which sits in your drawer or on your laptop or whatever. And and gathers dust and, you know, the, 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 there's no results that come out of that. So you have to make sure that the actions within your plan deliver results which are in line with your goals. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would say anyone starting a business, have a 12 month goal, break that 12 month goal down into monthly goals and then down into weekly and daily goals. And I'd monitor those daily. So when you're making a plan like that, uh, you can't obviously you can't obviously make a plan to achieve a result in the sense of you have to have inputs to the result. Yeah. So would you advise people to kind of. um create a list of inputs that you, they believe will achieve the result. Yeah, 100%. So it, it, it's an action plan of what actions do I take today, which delivers today's goals, which are in line with my weekly, monthly and annual goal. Um, and those inputs could be anything from sales to improving their finance system. Mm. Um, consistency is key. So staying consistent on what you do, you know, being brilliant at something for one day in the year isn't going to deliver results. Being mediocre every day will deliver a better result. Say that again, sorry. So being brilliant at something for one day in the year won't deliver brilliant results. Yep. Being mediocre at something consistently throughout the year will deliver better results than that one person who was brilliant for the day. Now, the counter to that is people think I need to be brilliant every day, which is kind of unrealistic, but... In an ideal world, it would be amazing. But the reality is you can't be on your A game every day. No, and no one ever is. Um, no one I've ever met is on their A game. And that's okay as well. But what you need to do is make a, and that's why it's called plan, and that's why it's called goals. And, and sometimes you have to readjust your goals, reevaluate and readjust your goals in line with what's happened. Something mm. might crop up which is completely outside of your control, which put you back a day, you know. So we all get those days and weeks where, you know, we are challenged. Yeah. I, I watched a video of Jeff, Jeff Bezos. Now, some people go, oh, yeah, he's a billionaire, he runs a massive company, and I'm just a small business. But he said something really interesting. I know what you're going to say, I think. <laughs> yeah. He said, my job is to make a small number of quality decisions. Okay. Yeah. A small number of quality decisions. Yeah. That's what I'm paid to do. And I was like, yeah. It's not the volume of his decisions. Yeah. And then his team are paid to make a number of quality decisions. Based on his decision. Yeah. 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 And it's that like, isn't what I thought you were going to say, actually. I was like, well, we'll come to what you thought I was going to say in a second. But I thought that was really, really um, powerful because yeah. what he's basically saying is if he's controlling all the decisions, one, he's literally running Amazon. He's in the middle of Amazon every day. Yeah. But we know he isn't. So he, he's choosing to decide which choices he makes versus the rest of the team. Yeah. So he's playing at his best because he only has to do a couple of things right. Yeah. Rather than try and do everything right. Yeah. So Branson says if you've got any more than three priorities, you've got no priorities. Okay. So similar sort yeah. of similar sort of thing. So but that's where you need that team of not just assistance but you need a team that has decision making power can solve issues themselves without you and that's yeah. a struggle for a, a lot of businesses where this is my baby yeah so you you've got two two thing two two types of owners there's the person who wants to hold on to everything and not release the reins and then you've got the other um side where they just want to give everything up um on both sides you have to onboard the right people. Mm -hmm. I learned this the hard way. So um, I think when, when I sold the business first time, we had about 20 staff. When I sold it second time, we had 54. Um, and 
when we, when we changed the business model to do chilled fresh frozen, we onboarded some people very quickly who really looked good on paper, but didn't deliver. And that taught us to onboard our people. So uh, my coach said, um, fire fast, hire slow. So we went from CV, red, get them in for an interview, interview them, you hired, you're not, or shortlist and then hired, you're not. We changed the model. So we would do a presentation from the business to a group of people. This is what, this is what we do. This is who we are. These are our values. These are our behaviors. You know, if you're interested in working for us, come back for an interview. And then we get them to answer some questions. And a lot of people, so we'd give them the option, if you're not interested, as the presentation goes on, just leave the room, no hard feelings or anything. But we were left with a small selection of people who were really vested and wanted to work for us because they liked what we did, mm -hmm. you know, and then you get their buy-in. And we also used to make decisions or um, build our goals and our plans and our strategy as a board. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't work as well as building it with your team because you get 100% buy-in from the team when they've had part of building that plan with you. So, yeah. Um, when you said earlier about behaviors, what did you yeah. mean by behaviors? Uh, you said our values, values and, and our behaviors. Yeah, so um, the way... Um, so there's a guy called Simon Sinek. I don't know whether mm -hmm. you know Simon Sinek. He, um, he's done a lot of testing uh, and research into the way um, mindset and, and the way people behave. And he worked with, again, the Navy SEALs. And they said that they would pick someone they would trust with their back over someone who was highly skilled. Okay. So trust is the biggest part. And he talks about how tr you should build trust in a business. Um, and that's what we were doing probably 10 years ago, 12 years ago, is <clears throat> there are a few instances within the business uh, where someone was pilfering stock and there was a system where someone did something wrong and it ended up being a fraudulent uh, um, uh, process that we had to go through. Um, so we decided to say the rules of the business, you needed to behave in a certain way. So professional, trustworthy, accountable, you know, all these good things, which people say, but they don't actually live by them. Mm -hmm. Well, that became part of our DNA. If someone behaved in a way that we didn't like, or we didn't want in the business, even if they were the best employee in the business, we'd get rid of them. It's pretty brutal, but I suppose it's the best way to build a business that works. Well, what we found is we had some really great people with really great attitudes, and we had some really great people with some bad attitudes or bad habits, and they didn't want to change. But what that was doing was sucking the team down. Mm. And without them, we would run quicker and grow quicker without them. Wow. So... Okay. It was hard to put our fingers on it uh, um, at the beginning that w why isn't it quite clicking? Why We've got a great team. You know, from a technical point of view, they're all mm -hmm. brilliant. But the culture of some people and the behaviors of some people aren't aligned. And we wanted to run a professional business which was trustworthy, which was honorable. You know, and I did things which a lot of people would cringe at because they didn't make commercial sense. But I knew it was the right thing to do for our customer, mm -hmm. and our customers valued it. Um, there was a um, strike, I think it was 2004, um, by one of the major airline catering companies. Um, they had a big issue. Um, I won't say what it was, because it could become more political, and don't want to get into <laughs> that. Um, but we supported them, whereas most of their suppliers didn't. And they could have gone bust but we continued to support them um, probably over a nine month period. And out of the back of that came one of our biggest, most profitable clients. And they knew we were making really good money out of them, but they appreciated what we did for them. Mm -hmm. And that was because of our values and our behaviors. We say that we behave this way and we actually live by that. Mm -hmm. So what was the thing you were gonna talk about with Bez Bezos? Um, so he said, what did he say now? Um, I only invest in things that change people's lives. 
Okay. So if you're looking at maybe starting a business and you need investment to do that, you know, a lot of people can say, well, you know, we're going to open a cafe or whatever. How is it going to be better than the others on the high street? Think of the Bezos statement, uh, um, quote, how is it going to change people's lives? Mm. Why are people going to pick you over anyone else? How is it going to enhance what they do? Mm. So, and if you can't answer that, I think you should maybe think about what you're going to do. So I spotted your fully electric in your car. <laughs> yes. So um, I read something and I'm just going to kind of run, I've just kind of burst your bubble a minute. Um, today, yep. the government's put out that they're going to start to release the legislation for fully automated cars in 2029. Yeah. Fully automated. Automated. So as in self-driving. Self-driving. Okay. Yeah. Um, but there was this really interesting thing. And I don't know why I'm off on this tangent, probably because we talked about Jeff Bezos, so we have to do Elon Musk, right? Um, That in this report for the government about how to put this out, there was this thing about safety, a moral dilemma on the safety issue. Yeah. Um, And you're Tesla, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so you've got the automated stuff in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and, And here's a really interesting thing that the company who made the car will be responsible for the accidents. Really? Yeah. So I was like... Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. But then they also said, the, there's no doubt self-driving cars will reduce accidents. Yeah. But then they left this dilemma of, overall, deaths and injuries from road traffic accidents will go down. Yeah. But will the public tolerate accidents in self-driving cars mm. because it's like good well, point i don't know what the accidents and deaths are but say yeah. it's ten thousand, and it comes down to seven thousand. but every death is then by a big company yeah yeah i mean you've got to look at it as a positive because they've come down yeah. but you know could if, you if it's if it's down to technology you know by 2029, will it be at the point that there's almost no deaths because the technology is so mm. good? But could you imagine, say, for an example, and I don't know how we got here, but we'll go with it. Bezos. Right? <laughs> um, imagine Tesla, right? Yeah. They've got their self-driving cars. It's 2030, and there's however many thousands of them on the road, right? Then some stat comes out that actually 2,000 people have died because of... Tesla's self-driving. Yeah. Are we he- are we heading into a place whereby that's a that's you know what I mean the 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 um the perception shifts. Yeah. And you end up where actually Elon Musk killed 2000 people. <laughs> yeah, it's an in- interesting point, but I I think I mean could it kill a brand? More importantly, you know, Volvo killed 1,000, Tesla killed 2,000, and we're not saying that those are the stats or will yeah. be the stats, but, um, yeah, I mean, it could be, like, the end of their success if some if, if a stat like that came out. And that, that, that for me, is, like, really fascinating because the, you, human beings, we always change to the way the world is. So, yeah. so suddenly we've got a new reality where we're self-driving cars, and actually now... Tesla's caused the death. Yeah. It's like... Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think... Although I would love the idea of getting in my car and being driven everywhere because I find, you know, it took me four and a half, nearly five hours to get here last yesterday afternoon. You know, I could have been doing much more from my desk. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's much better to meet you in person, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but would I switch on self-driving in the car? Well, you know, in the, the government proposed legislation or the suggestions from this research body one of them is that you're in in car entertainment yeah so tv games or whatever can be played as long as you're not on a motorway no yeah it's in there and i was like (laughs) i'm not sure i'd be able to do that yeah no no definitely not one for me (laughs) but there's i don't know you've seen there's some kind of things like where um cars of the future where you can sit down you can 
lie down yeah. and actually the car will drive you overnight somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, that sounds pretty cool, but at the same time it's like, mm. Yeah, I, th I think maybe a bigger risk is the car's a computer basically. What if someone hacked into some sort of mainframe which made every car turn left, to, you know, within a 30 yeah. second period or something like that? I think that's probably a bigger worry. Yeah, or like crashing or, yeah. you know, like the system crashes or yeah. um, we've seen it with um, software updates. Yeah. Something goes wrong with a software update. All of these questions leave you going, well, what happens if that? Yeah, quite. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is just, a risk. It is just, a risk. I, I, I love Tesla, by the way. I think Elon Musk is a genius. But there's a really funny thing at the moment. So if you've got a self-driving car yeah. and I got a brick wall and printed a tunnel. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I dropped that backdrop, the car currently can't tell the difference. So you would hit. Yeah. Or if I wore a stop sign on my yeah. T-shirt and stood by the road, the car would stop. So that you, it also makes you wonder whether there's, it's open to mischief. Well, I know from having a logistics business that uh, driverless trucks, the technology is there. Um, so the way that would work is you'd have one truck um, with a driver in it driving, and then there would be two or three trucks behind that one, which were in um, uh, driverless mode. Mm -hmm. Um, but they need to change the traffic lights in the UK, uh, roundabouts coming off motorways and things. So if the driver went through, the other two or three trucks would go through, could mm. get through as well. Um, so, yeah, I think infrastructure, maybe they put new signs out. If, you know, a stop sign doesn't need to be there anymore. Mm. Maybe it's just a signal, which is code, mm. you know. So outside of business... Driving Teslas. Yeah. Um, what else does David get up to? Um, so, always been into my golf. I did have a 17 year period where I didn't play at all, but um, I was a golf professional, then um, set up this business, knee injury. So, I play golf now, play off uh, five. Um, um, I used to enjoy racing motorbikes, but turned 51 this year and decided <laughs> that I'm not going to do that. You know, it hurts when you come off. <laughs> so um, enjoy that. I've got a young family and an old family, one for another day, but I've got three-year-old twins and a 24-year-old daughter. So, yeah. Uh, three-year-old <coughs> twins will keep you really busy. Um, one on one does not equal two when it comes to children. <laughs> 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 and you're based uh, Chichester. Ch Chichester, West Sussex, yeah. 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 Beautiful, so, beautiful part of the world. So it was fun coming all the way to Plymouth. Do you know what? It's a really nice drive. It's a really long drive as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, um, you're on social media. Yeah. you got your website. Yeah. I'll put all the details there. Okay. Um, how are you enjoying being on LinkedIn? Um, now, compared to what I was before, um, I used to see LinkedIn as a place to network if I needed a new supplier or if I was trying to find a new customer. Um, but I didn't really use it. When I signed up to, Mo I, I knew you could get more out of it, mm. but I didn't know how. So when I signed up for the first, I think it was a free webinar, then a, a low cost web a webinar, and then a paid course, and mm. now a premium course. But my eyes have been open to actually um, the size of the opportunity and how quickly you can start to see um, Results. So, uh, prime example, eight weeks ago, before I started one of your courses, um, I would make a post and it might get 20 to 80 impressions. One of my posts this week has had 11,000 already. It's awesome. You know, um, my network's grown by over 1,500 people in that period of time. Um, yeah, it's it's... It's really exciting what the future holds with the, with you, the way you strategize and the way you deliver um, and coach people to improve within that um, network and obviously within TikTok and, uh, and and I don't have a Lamborghini. Yeah, do you not? No. Oh, I thought it was part round the back. Is that not yours? No. 
<laughs> as soon as I see a Lamborghini, I go, <laughs> they've just like, I, I don't know why you'd, I, have I ever told you about the Lamborghini stats? No. So you've discovered from last night about my addiction to learning information about yes. things. Yeah. So a Lamborghini, you know, depending on what you buy, 200 grand, 300 grand, whatever you want to pay for it, right? So the average Lamborghini does 5,000 miles a year. Yeah. Yeah. It costs you about £20,000 a year in fuel. Then you've got the maintenance. They don't depreciate so much, so you don't yeah. lose a lot on depreciation. But effectively, it's costing you at least twenty grand a year, so £4 a mile, more now because of fuel prices. Yeah. There's probably maintenance in there, so it's costing you £20,000 a year to drive around in something that doesn't go over speed bumps, very rarely gets up to its top speed. In fact, unless you go to a racetrack, never yep. gets to its top speed. Um, and um, you've it's got... It's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's not very comfortable. So you, you go, why are people buying this car? It's all image. It, it is all about image. Uh, and since I started working with my coach, um, you know, my perception on most things has changed so um i was 26 when i started the business i retired when i was 37 first time for two weeks <laughs> and i used to change my car my, my car more than i changed my underwear uh, not quite but um you know and i'd have high performance cars now i'm not interested in that anymore it, it that's not important to mm -hmm. me you know i was young i was naive and you know, you're allowed to be when you're mm -hmm. young, have these aspirations and it looks good. Mm -hmm. But actually, what value does it add to mm -hmm. your life? It doesn't. I, I about where, where, 10 years ago, I met somebody, Albert, and um, many of the team know Albert as well. And he, down to earth guy, built a business in the retail sector, sold it for... Um, I've got his book somewhere here. Uh, sold it for like 40-odd million in the 90s, maybe late yeah. 80s. And to meet Albert, he drove a 10, 11-year-old Jag. Yeah. Whenever I met him, we'd go to the Beef Eater. It was so like straightforward, down-to-earth, never lost touch with his roots, yeah. but could probably, you know, he could live whatever life he wanted to. But it always struck me how he'd made a ton of money and it was just really straightforward, didn't care for a lot of the stuff yeah. that today's society says that that's the sign of success. And actually, I think, I think some of that's quite toxic because what it's encouraging you to say is tell the world you're successful, not be it. Yeah, so, so you're living a life that you don't actually live. You know, mm. I... Growing up, I know people who would spend their month's wage on a pair of trainers or a T-shirt or something because it per the perception was they're doing really well. But then they sort of eat pot noodles and, you know, couldn't afford to eat properly. And you go, what's the point in this? Because you're satisfying people around you rather than yourself. Um, you know, I know a couple of billionaires and the one that I'm thinking of at the moment, you know, yes, he loves, lives in a lovely property, multi-million pound property, but his cars, and he's got a lot of cars, but they're all 20, 30 year old Range Rovers or mm. whatever. He's into collecting cars, which will go up in value. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a Lamborghini. He doesn't have a Ferrari. You know, he, he's very down to, and if you met him, you wouldn't know that he got any money. Mm -hmm. because he is just a normal guy who is very intelligent and very good at what he does. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. David, thank you so much for being on the podcast. No, a uh, pleasure. I've, I don't uh, think we touched all of any of our points. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, guys, do check out anywhere you're watching this, the links or listening to this, the links to David's LinkedIn's there. Um, do If you're curious about getting the business going, ramping it up, or you're facing some of the challenges we talked about, Reach out to David. At the very least, you'll give them some pointers. And if you can help them, you'll let them know how you can help. Exactly that. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. So thank you for tolerating my unscripted podcast. <laughs> thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> and, I, and I do hope you come back. I uh, definitely will be. Yeah. <laughs> next thank, month. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. And see you on the next episode.